Hello. I'm Michael Hussey. I'm Dean here at Widener Law Commonwealth. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our annual Jurist in Residence Lecture hosted by our Law and Government Institute. The Institute helps students explore how government works and the roles that lawyers play in making and implementing law. As a result, our students develop a passion for government law, which in turn leads to Widener Law Commonwealth alumni working in all areas of government law and public service. Our alumni are key to ensuring the rule of law is rightly developed and faithfully implemented. I hope you find today's lecture engaging and thought-provoking. For those of you that are with us on campus, we'll have a reception in the gallery following today's lecture. It is now my pleasure to introduce Lindsay Williamson, who will be a 2024 graduate of the law school. Lindsay is extremely active in our law school community. She currently serves as the Vice President of Membership of the Law and Government Student Society. She is the President of the Environmental Law and Policy Society. She is on both the Moot Court Honor Society and the Trial Advocacy Honor Society boards. And in her spare time, she is a staff member of the Widener Commonwealth Law Review. And after all of that, we may have to get her on third shift for campus safety as well. <laughs> So please join me in welcoming Lindsay. Thank you, Dean Hussey. Good afternoon. The Jurist in Residence program is sponsored by the Law and Government Institute and is pleased to present the Honorable Judge Royce L. Morris as today's moderator. Judge Morris dedicated over 25 years of distinguished service as an attorney before receiving his gubernatorial appointment to the Dauphin County Court of Common Pleas in 2018. His legal career has involved litigating complex and politically sensitive matters on behalf of individuals and corporations. Judge Morris is also Widener University Commonwealth's Law School's jurist in residence. In addition, he teaches at Widener, and I had the privilege of taking his government law colloquium course last fall, which focused on sentencing advocacy. This semester, Judge Morris's course is focused on juvenile delinquency. Many of his current students are here today. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to the Honorable Judge Morris. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Dean Hussey. Uh, and thanks to everyone. This is truly an honor for me to be the jurist in residence at Widener Commonwealth Law School and also to present this uh, lecture uh, each year. Uh, we have some great folks who have been a part of this in the past and we have an exceptional uh, two folks today uh, two individuals who I think we're going to learn a lot from about juvenile law and just about the issues of the way that we get from one area of the law to the other, the legislative part, to the actual nuts and bolts of what happens on the street. And let me introduce those uh, two folks to you. I have uh, to my left, your right, Patty Kim, a former news anchor, reporter, and Harrisburg City Councilwoman who was elected to the State House in 2012 and has been a leader in government reform and transparency. Kim's priority in the General, General Assembly includes taking a resolution-based approach to statewide issues, working in cooperation and collaboration with colleagues, and utilizing her record of service to support initiatives that stand to better the lives of all citizens in this area. Leading her caucus's charge to provide a livable wage for Pennsylvanians, Kim has introduced bills to increase minimum wage. She continues to fight for minimum increase to restore the middle class by lifting thousands of Pennsylvanians out of po poverty. Her priority also includes combating climate change. Kim serves on the appropriations, education, insurance, local government committees. She is on the uh, Capital Preservation Committee as treasurer, Team uh, PA Board of Directors, United Way for Capital Region Board of Directors. Kim also serves as the Deputy Whip of the House Democratic Caucus. Prior to her work in the legislature, obviously she was a Harrisburg City Councilman is when I got to know her. And one thing I know about her on a personal note, she really has a heart for the community and that includes the entire community. Uh, those folks who are disadvantaged and marginalized are particularly the ones that she looks out for. We also have uh, today, Marsha Levitt. Uh, Marsha is the co-founder and chief legal officer of the Juvenile Law Center, America's first public interest law firm for children. Throughout her career, 
Ms. Levick has advocated for youth involved in justice and child welfare systems and currently manages the Juvenile Law Center's national litigation docket. Levitt has uh, participated in numerous landmark cases, including the United States Supreme Court cases of Roper versus Simmons, Graham versus Florida, Miller versus Alabama, and Montgomery versus Louisiana, all striking extreme adult sentences for youth in the criminal justice system. And JB, uh, JDB versus North Carolina, requiring consideration of a suspect's youth during police interrogations. Levick also led Juvenile Law Center's work in the Luzerne County PA Kids for Cash uh, scandal, which we all should be aware of. And her work there led to the vacature and expungement of nearly 2,500 juvenile adjudications and substantial financial awards to the youth and their parents. And that's how I became uh, acquainted with Ms. Levick. I was honored to give her the award from Pennsylvania Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys for her work in the Kids for Cash scandal uh, just a few years ago. Uh, she is the uh, 2015 uh, winner of the Philadelphia Award, the Arlen Specter Award uh, in 2013, the Philadelphia Inquirer Citizen of the Year Award in 2009, as well as recognition for her work with the American Bar Association, the American Association of Justice, and the Pennsylvania Bar Association and the Philadelphia Bar Association, among others. She's also an adjunct professor at Temple University Beasley School of Law and the University of Pennsylvania School of Law. So as you can tell, they are very qualified to speak to us about this issue. And I'm gonna keep this uh, sort of in a question and answer format so that you're not hearing from me, you're hearing from the folks who have the information. And uh, my first question is for Representative Kim. Um, and you can give a sort of an opening statement about your position on a lot of things, but let me ask the general question first, and then I'll let you uh, address us. Uh, at the direction of former Governor Tom Wolf in December of 2019, with bipartisan and interbranch support of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, the Speaker of the House, the President of the Senate, the Minority Leader and other leaders, the Pennsylvania Ju Juvenile Justice Task Force was composed to conduct a comprehensive data-driven assessment of Pennsylvania's juvenile justice system. They were tasked with developing recommendations to serve as the foundation for budgetary, legislative, administrative changes in juvenile justice. And here we sit in 2023. There have been no changes. Uh, COVID delayed the report and it wasn't released until June of 21. However, still have no meaningful legislation that's come out of the recommendations. And my question, and you can elaborate, when the governor puts together a task force like the one that I've just described, how does the legislature react? And how do we get to meaningful legislation? And what are the challenges to getting to meaningful legislation when we have such a you know, big effort um, and a mandate that the governor sort of wants you to move? Thank you, Judge, for that question. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see some familiar faces here. Um, and for coming out. So when I was chair of public safety on city council, I asked to shadow the police for one night and we were riding around and we saw a bunch of uh, teenage boys standing on the sidewalk and we had a curfew back then. And these guys are like six feet tall and you know, my kids were young so I didn't quite understand teenagers. But when they apprehended them, one of the boys was kneeling on the ground and the first thing he said was mommy. And that broke my heart as these children in big bodies are really little kids who um, have lost their way. And so I think that um, as we move forward that there are more people in the legislature that have compassion, have empathy for folks uh, who we're gonna be talking about now. So I wanna thank the judge for inviting me because this wasn't exactly on my radar. This is important to me, but it's not on my radar. For legislators, you know, we have thousands of thousands of issues that we can take upon that can come before us. But if you did not work in the juvenile justice system, if you have not had a personal experience with your son or daughter, and you didn't have an advocate in your office, this is not something that we think about every day. 
So um, I just want to uh, emphasize for those that this is really important to you, advocacy and talking to legislators is really important because it just puts that thing in front of their minds and can become a priority. In the last 10 years that I've been here, I've been so grateful that criminal justice reform has been a bipartisan issue. Um, Governor Wolf has uh, helped uh, pass the Clean Slate Bill that would help um, take off nonviolent charges on people's records. Uh, that has been on for at least 10 years. Governor Wolf is the only governor that has pardoned the most people in his tenure. Uh, in my office, um, that's something that we've done a lot to help people walk people through that parting process because we think it's so important to give people a second chance. Um, and by the way, Clean Slate was, we were the first to do this in the nation. Pennsylvania was the first to do that. So we're really proud of that. So to the question, um, how do we react? I thought it was brilliant that Governor Wolf put together a bipartisan, bicameral, inner branch task force. So that um, I talked to one of the gentlemen, uh, state rep, Mike Zabel, who was on the task force. You know, he was an assistant Philadelphia district attorney, but never really leaned into this issue until he was on the task force. And now he's one of the leaders. So now we have um, legislators in the Senate, uh, R's and D's in the House, R's and D's, who were listening to hours and hours of testimony. So they got a PhD into the juvenile justice system and were there to help make the recommendations. So throughout today, Marsha Levick, who is awesome, and I watched your TED Talk and did an amazing job uh, in just uh, giving us the history of, she's been working on the ground, and she talked about the pendulum where we swing and go really strict and then we loosen it up. And I'm here to tell you that we are going to help loosen up the laws because I think there are um, a lot. I'm Today was our first day of session and I'm finally in the majority. Rob Teplitz, you kind of already understand that. It felt so good. And I know that my caucus, uh, this is important to them. So I'm gonna be very hopeful today in how we discuss these bills and uh, moving forward, okay? Marsha Levick, uh, this question is for you. Uh, and as uh, Representative Kim said, you are uh, brilliant and uh, you've done this work. Uh, and so you have a, a great perspective. But let me address this to you. I, I believe that legislature, legislative action tends to be reactionary. So in 1995, the crime bill was driven uh, in part by this false narrative that came out of this whole notion of super predators and the sensational cases like the Central Park Five. So out of that wave of legislation across the country, not just in PA, we saw these harsh juvenile laws and juveniles being treated as adults. Then through your great work with uh, Kids for Cash tragedy, we saw some action, uh, but mostly around procedural changes uh, to ensure more due process within the system. Fast forward to 2019, when we saw the abuse scandals at Glen Mills, Devereaux, and other places around the Commonwealth. That's what led to the task force. Do you think that in this current climate, uh, that's gonna drive change in the juvenile justice system? Or has the window passed since we had the pandemic and those things happened in 2019 and 18 and around that area? Uh, do you think the window's passed? How do we drive this change? So um, that was a lot. <laughs> um, first of all, let me just thank you, Judge Morris, for inviting me to join um, what looks like a pretty good crowd today. I assume a lot of people are online and hopefully some folks are there in the room with you. And also, I'm um, sorry, Representative Kim, that I cannot be there to join you in person. Um, and I'm so interested in hearing um, about your work in the House. And yes, congratulations on a Democratic majority. Very exciting. Um, okay, so to answer your question, <laughs> Um, I'm interested and perhaps hardened to that Representative Kim thinks the pendulum, the pendulum is swinging um, in what I think we would consider a positive direction. Um, I certainly think that the, the events that you identify, Judge Morris, um, the 1995 crime bill in Pennsylvania that is, was in response to the super predator myth, kids for cash, 
the abuses that were flagrant and horrifying um, and that were exposed at Glen Mills and at Devereaux, um, each of these have been pivotal either in taking us in the wrong direction or, or certainly what I think would be the correct direction. Um, but it is an endlessly frustrating. Um, I've been doing this work for a really long time. We count it in decades. And it is it is sad to me that we constantly seem to keep relearning the lessons of the past. And I think we are at risk right now as we are coming out of the pandemic. There has been legitimately and honestly an uptick in some crime. Um, certainly in Philadelphia, there's been an uptick in violent crime and in other jurisdictions across Pennsylvania and other jurisdictions across the country. It's also a fact that crime remains at very low rates historically, but if communities don't feel safe, that matters, and their perception um, is one that is very personal to them, and I think perceptions of safety are inherently personal. So I, I worry that uh, the momentum will get lost and that there is a risk that it is politically favorable um, to some in the political system to talk about rising crime rates and to push that narrative out there and to utilize it as an opportunity to push back against some very, um, I think, really positive things that have happened for kids in Pennsylvania. Lots of good things happen after Kids for Cash. I think that there, during the last 10 or 15 years, Rates of custody for children in secure care have dropped by 50 or 60 percent. Frankly, arrest rates have dropped uh, really exponentially. The number of juvenile detention facilities operating in the state have been cut in half. That was all in response to reduced crime rates and less in need for those kinds of secure beds for children. Um, we're in another moment now, and I know you have more questions that we'll be looking at some of those issues. Um, but I think that I guess it was a really long answer to say, I don't know. I really don't know. I think that, frankly, um, we're always a little bit at risk of slipping backwards. And then I guess the, the follow up would be for you, Representative Kim, uh, ha has the window passed? Uh, we're in we have a new governor. Um, it's been three years. Um, and there has been really no uh, substantial legislation passed. Uh, has the window passed to, to make some reform in the juvenile justice system? So a little bit of perspective. Um, the legislature moves as quickly as molasses. Um, medical marijuana passed um, several years ago, and the first senator to introduce that was over 30 years ago. Uh, I have reintroduced uh, minimum wage, a high raise in minimum wage for the last 10 years, and we still haven't passed it. So this is a long game. Uh, it's probably not very encouraging to hear that. Um, I kind of chuckle that you guys say that, you know, the recommendations came out in 2021 and nothing's done. We, we need a minute. We need a minute to, to get things going. We have bills already with all the recommendations. Most of them were unanimous or overwhelmingly um, passed uh, in the Senate. Uh, Senator Baker had put all of the um, recommendations into four separate bills, and then Senator uh, Bartolota also put one in there too. So you're right, we're in a new session, and they all have to be reintroduced. Actually, the Senate has already reintroduced it and will be put into committee to be discussed. Um, some good news, um, the person who I was talking about earlier who was on the task force, Representative Mike Zabel, as well as uh, Republican uh, Representative Natalie Mihalik, just put together the Youth Safety Caucus specifically to address all of the recommendations that came out of the task force. So momentum, you know, sways back and forth, but it's really important to have somebody who's carrying that flag for ju juvenile justice reform. And I believe these two folks who are the caucus members will carry that flag uh, moving forward. So we have to be a little bit patient. Um, I know that the speaker, um, excuse me, we hope that the future speaker, you know, was a public defender. We have a lot of state reps who worked in the DA's office or worked with children. Um, and we have the most diverse and most women in this legislature, which I think is perfect 
to help pass along these very kind of um, fair and compassionate bills for our youth. Uh, next question is uh, for you, uh, Ms. Lubbock. Uh, as a judge, of course, I would tend to favor anything that would give judges more discretion. However, on the decision to transfer juveniles to adult court, this whole notion of direct files, should there be legislative change, in your opinion, putting the power back in the hands of judges to determine whether or not juveniles are tried as adults? Absolutely. <laughs> um, I support you having more discretion. I think that uh, the direct file, which is a process whereby children can be transferred to the adult criminal justice system for prosecution and for sentencing uh, without any review by a judge. Uh, initially at the charging phase, there is the opportunity for judges to uh, consider sending those cases back to juvenile court. Um, but what we would like to see, and I know that there has been legislation that has been introduced, and this was one of the recommendations that came out of the task force, is to really just simply make this an entirely discretionary process. And I think what's important about the legislative proposals and the recommendations is that the current system places the decision for sending cases back from criminal court to juvenile court in the hands of criminal court judges. Um, I think that juvenile court judges by and large um, have a better lens through which to view these cases sitting in juvenile court, understanding the youth who come before them, understanding uh, the issues that uh, are drivers of youth crime and also the opportunities for change and for rehabilitation. So that I think the recommendation, which is to really restore the discretion uh, to rest it exclusively in juvenile court to make these decisions is one that I fully support. And I guess the follow-up uh, for you, uh, Representative Kim, is there, uh, is there the political will for that kind of change? I know that was one of the recommendations, um, but I think that might be one of the harder battles to change that. Uh, and keep in mind, I, I ask you to consider um, that 60% of direct files, and this is according to the report, 60% of direct file cases are ultimately dismissed, withdrawn, or end up in juvenile court. Uh, and black boys make up 7% of the state's youth population, but account for 60 or 56% of the adult prosecutions. So I looked up um, this recommendation and representatives Harris, Zabel, and Miller will all um, have all sponsored a bill that would address this uh, to end direct files for juveniles. Um, within the task force with this recommendation, that bill passed or was voted 29 to one. And I believe the one was somebody from the district attorneys association. So they may be the one that might um, put some breaks on that bill. Um, but again, um, advocacy, lobbying, trying to work out a compromise. I don't know if there's much of a compromise, but um, that would probably be the sticking point um, for that bill. And uh, Ms. Levick, uh, I just to add to that point, um, I know there is consideration for this change of the age of direct files from 14 to 16 years of age. Do you think that that makes a difference or is that something that you think would be meaningful change? I definitely think it's meaningful change. I think that um, the, the capacity that children have to change and to become rehabilitated um, and to, and, and at the same time that we recognize those capacities to also be able to protect community and public safety, um, I think supports raising the age. I think that is a very difficult hurdle. <laughs> um, it, you know, so looking directly at you, Representative Kim, through the screen, um, I think that you know there there are several different ways in which I think we would like to see direct file and the prosecution of children in adult criminal court in Pennsylvania addressed. I think first and foremost, we would certainly like to pull that discretion entirely back into the juvenile court give it to juvenile court judges and get rid of direct file. You know, the longer game, um, to quote Representative Kim, maybe to think very seriously about changing that age and raising the age, um, I suspect that's a high bar uh, right now in Pennsylvania. 
I just wanted to also really underscore something that you said, Judge Morris. Um, the racial disparities, they, they pervade our juvenile and adult criminal justice systems. They are no less pervasive and troubling when we think about the prosecution of children in the adult criminal justice system. And those kinds of uh, discrepancies that we see among uh, youth, among white youth and youth of color in Pennsylvania, I think are issues that we need to start paying attention to and to ensure that our policies, um, not just th that address it and respond to it and attempt to fix it. Thank you. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later, uh, but let me uh, jump to another uh, issue that I think is uh, important. Uh, there's a, a shortage of uh, pre-adjudication uh, detention beds. There's a proposal to limit detention for kids under age 14, unless there is a determination that the youth is a specific, immediate and substantial risk of harm to others. And there is no other alternative to reduce the risk to others. Uh, have you found, or do you believe that judges are using detention too often for nonviolent kids? And I'll go to uh, Ms. Levick. Yeah, I, I'm glad that you asked that question. I think it's one that's very present for many of us today who are concerned about and working in the Pennsylvania juvenile justice system. So I mentioned in my last answer, the tendency that we have to have to relearn lessons of the past. This question reminds me of how often we commit the same mistakes of the past. When we see shortages in detention after a very significant number of years, more than a decade of reductions in the use of secure pretrial detention, we, we tend to assume that the answer is, well, then we just need more beds, we need to reopen facilities that have been closed, and let's reincarcerate kids yet again. Um, we're as a nation, and I think certainly Pennsylvania reflects this, we tend to be addicted um, to custody and incarceration as a way out of our problems. But there is significant research that has been out there for a while that youth do better in communities, they do better closer to home to the extent that, and I think the proposal that you cited, raising the age to 14, uh, being very focused on safety risks as being a justification for detention are, I think, appropriate considerations to both limit the use of secure, secure detention, but also make it available in circumstances where it seems like it's really required. And yet at the same time, doesn't put us in this position of always assuming that we can incarcerate our way out of a problem. Uh, and your work, your great work uh, has probably done a little bit to sort of create some of this problem uh, that people perceive because we have lost a lot of pre-adjudication detention beds. And, and as a juvenile judge, uh, we have to make decisions because we don't have places to put the young people. Uh, and I think it's a good problem to have, but um, do, do you think that we should uh, be encouraging judges to look for community uh, opportunities that, that they have to sort of create because they're not there. Yeah, um, also again, thank you for that question. Absolutely, um, you know, I think that we, we tend to allocate resources um, in very specific ways and often away from communities, away from kids and families. And yes, it is unfortunate that we have always invested more in, I would say the bricks and mortar of the juvenile justice system than we have in uh, services and resources for communities and families. And we need to switch those priorities. And I, I appreciate, I, I'm, I'm realistic, I'm not naive. I understand the challenges that you as a judge and other juvenile court judges are probably facing um, when you feel like there may be a safety need to detain someone um, and you're struggling to find a bed to place that child. But I think that um, at the same time that we have that conversation, we also need to be exploring ways that we can build up resources in the community, support children and families, so that we are not, as I said, uh, repeating the mistakes of the past. Uh, Representative Kim, uh, I guess the question for you is, uh, we, we do have, this is a, a crisis, and, and I don't know if 
the legislature is aware of this. And when I say a crisis, I, I mean it that uh, we're having judges uh, frequently asking for uh, beds uh, and trying to find resources and places to put children. Uh, and there clearly right now are not enough in the minds of some judges, detention beds for these kids. Um, would you support a proposal that would require no detention for kids under age 14? So Judge, you're I'm learning at the same time here. This is not something that I um, am an expert on, um, but I, I do believe that proposal would, would work. I think you know, 10, 11, 12 year olds um, should be at home, but if the home life environment is not healthy, uh, I know that there is a program called Close to Home in New York where they renovated a large brownstone home and the home is um, not as stark um, than maybe a, a regular facility. And what I think works well is that our communities know what's best for their children. And I have met so many people who come out of prison, change their lives in prison, and now just wants to make sure that no kid does exactly what they do and, and go to prison. And those people are gems in our communities who've had the experience, who can speak the language, and then have a heart to want to serve the youth. And to have folks like that work in these, it's, I think it's called close to home um, facilities, or they maybe even be familiar with the kids and to mentor them and help them, um, again, redirect their lives into a, a healthier, uh, nonviolent way. So I think it has, um, you know, if we can put the resources in there and then have the community support to really help bring these kids back, uh, I think that would be ideal to have that in, in every community. And if I didn't say it earlier, um, I'm open to questions. If anyone has a question, I'll continue to ask my questions. And if you have a pressing question, you can uh, certainly raise your hand. There's a question on the chat. Have your so they just turn it on. Okay, just push it, it'll turn blue. Do any of the panelists regard the school to jail continuum to be appropriate to this panel discussion? And if so, would anyone care to comment on that phenomena? And I, I guess I'll try to couch that. Uh, um, uh, Attorney Levick, uh, the uh, school to prison pipeline, it's a, it's a term that's thrown around out there um, and, you know, it's created some weight in the, in the uh, parlance of, of this area. Uh, do you have any comments about that? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, first of all, you know, I would note that it really was the phenomenon of the school to prison pipeline that was very central to the Kiss for Cash scandal. Um, while there was a money thing going on, um, and obviously a lot of uh, inappropriate money changed hands between the judges and other individuals in the Zern County, um, Judge Chivarella was essentially begging, urging schools to refer kids to him for school-based conduct, and those were kids that he then placed into juvenile correctional settings, um, either ones that he had a financial interest in or even other facilities across the state. School to prison pipeline has been a significant phenomenon in this country, at least since the turn of the 21st century. Um, it has uh, fed, although it didn't start in 2000, it certainly has fed and nurtured the presence of police and school resource officers in schools. And that presence, again, there's lots of research about these issues that we don't use enough, um, but there's quite a bit of research that police and school resource officers in schools actually don't make schools safer. Um, and it was certainly very clear in the Kids for Cash scandal we saw children who were convicted, charged with, and then convicted of largely, um, I would say misdemeanors, but I would also say things that were more like normative adolescent behavior, not really things that should rise to the attention of law enforcement or even the juvenile justice system. Um, so I think the school to prison pipeline lives, let's be clear. Uh, schools continue to be a feeder 
for children coming into the juvenile justice system. We continue to think of schools as an environment where law enforcement should have a presence. Um, and I think that that's a mistake. There has been some movement recently to really push for the removal of school resource officers um, from the school setting. I, I recognize again, um, we are always concerned about the terrible news that crosses our screens one day about another school shooting, but that's, that's not what the school to prison pipeline is about. And it is pulling in kids who don't need to be involved in the juvenile justice system. And we need to think about what we're doing. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add, but I do would like to just, you know, highlight the inequities in our public schools and funding. And after the recent um, uh, decision about how our public school funding is unconstitutional, I think if we do more investments where teachers have more support and we can attract um, diverse teachers, which I think is super important, as well as qualified teachers, so that they're not in overcrowded classrooms in chaotic situations and can tell that this child actually can't read and is not a bad kid and just needs some extra support. I'm simplifying that, but I know that there are a lot of students who will act up before they have to read out loud in class because they just want to get out of there and not be embarrassed in front of all their friends. So um, I think that having um, fully and fairly funded schools will also be helpful um, when it comes to um, the juvenile justice system. Let me jump to funding um, quickly um, so that we can at least address that topic. Funding is always an issue. And currently, Pennsylvania has no statewide public defender system. Uh, but one of the proposals is that we uh, expand funding to incident, incident defense for juveniles. Uh, so how do we get there uh, if we're, we're not currently fully funding our state public defender system? I'll throw that out to you, uh, Ms. Levick. Um, I'll be happy to answer first, and then I'm going to kick it to Representative Kim. <laughs> um, yeah, so Pennsylvania, it's, I think, one of um, maybe the only one left, or there may be one other state in the country that does not provide statewide funding for public defense services for individuals who can't afford an attorney on their own. Um, and this is kind of shocking. <laughs> I don't think it's a, it's not a good look for Pennsylvania. I think it's unfortunate that we remain stuck in this position. There are excellent public defender offices across the state of Pennsylvania, funded largely through county dollars, and our unwillingness to make a commitment to ensure competent, meaningful, and effective counsel for children is critical because the role that lawyers play in juvenile court, the role that lawyers play for defendants in criminal cases, um, it's not just about defending them against charges that they faced. I think in juvenile court, they also play a very unique role, which is ensuring that the system provides the services that it was set up to provide to children. The juvenile justice system is inherently a rehabilitative system. It is not meant to be a punitive system. And lawyers are essential in that, uh, that universe of stakeholders who all have something to say and something to offer in that process, kids need lawyers, as I said, not just to advocate for them in the determination of their guilt or innocence, but to ensure that if they're convicted that they get the services that they're entitled to. So the fiscal impact of a bill that is being introduced to have representation, I think it's through the county and there'll be reimbursement through the county. Um, is going to be a sticking point and it's going to be a difficult sell. Um, our budget is all about priorities and I don't know if this is top on the list. So it will be an uphill battle to get the appropriate funding for, um, for this, this type of program. And I think that's, that's an honest uh, assessment of, of where we find ourselves a lot, a lot of times with this type of defense of these individuals. But having been a public defender, uh, I know that uh, being under-resourced and, and, and not able to uh, m retain uh, qualified uh, and competent counsel creates problems for uh, adult and juvenile uh, defendants. Uh, so funding is something we definitely need, and it, it sounds like that's going to be a, a, a hard sell. Uh, how do you envision uh, diversion, keeping kids out of the system, uh, 
before they get to a judge, before they uh, have a court process? Uh, how do you envision diversion and the expansion of diversion so that we have uh, kids who get in trouble but don't actually get to see a courtroom because we've done something on the front end to try to rehabilitate, to you know, work with them, their families, and their communities to keep them out of the system. How do you envision diversion? Uh, I'll start with uh, Ms. Uh, Levick and then Ms. Kim. So I think the good news is that we have expanded our use of diversion uh, in the last 10 or 15 years across Pennsylvania. And there are certainly individual counties which do a particularly good job of it. The Philadelphia District Attorney's Office, I think, has really attempted to invest in diversion and has set up a specific diversion unit so that they can make decisions before kids come into contact uh, and really penetrate into the juvenile justice system to keep them out. The issue about diversion is one that is really about right-sizing our juvenile justice system. And the, the, the reason to support diversion is again, to ensure that kids who do not really pose uh, significant safety risks, whose conduct is not really um, the type of conduct that needs to rise to the level of the attention of law enforcement or the juvenile justice system to again, provide services in the community. So I'm gonna repeat a theme that I said earlier, you can't do diversion if you don't have community services. And counties and the state, and I think this happens with both county and state funding, have to make choices and have to, and in making those choices, hopefully make smart choices that investing in resources in communities. And I, I wanna echo Representative Kim's comment about also looking to communities to tell us what they need, looking to children and families to tell us what they need, uh, that if we invest resources to support them, uh, that we can expand diversion, reduce the very deep costs that incarceration uh, requires to keep kids in secure care. We're talking about hundreds of dollars a day, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Uh, this is not just about keeping kids out of the system. It's also about using financial resources wisely. Again, can't add much to what Marsha just said, but my ideal diversion technique, if you will, is um, if something's going on with a kid, something most likely is going on at home. And to have a wraparound service for the family or have a caseworker with a social worker, an attorney, somebody from the state who can sit down and talk about what's going on with the family. If, if one of the parents, grandparents need a job, you know, are they, you know, rent, whatever, to have that wraparound services for that family. You can't, you can try to heal the child, but you need to heal the whole family for it, to, for he or him or her to um, become healthier. So I would love to see that as a diversion program. And just as a follow-up to that, sh should schools uh, be more involved in, in the process and how problematic is that in the public education setting? Um, because a lot of these lower level offenses come out of school setting. Um, so it looks like you're looking at me. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. And it's a hard question, as Representative Kim noted, and my colleagues down the hall from me in my office in Philadelphia, uh, who litigated the school funding case, the Education Law Center. Um, you know, the first story about that case is that we don't spend enough in all of our school districts across the country to ensure, across the state, to ensure the kids are getting um, a really top rate quality education. Uh, so I'm sure that to the extent that there are folks listening, um, watching and hearing about asking schools to do something else, there's probably a moment of panic, but schools are where kids spend most of their time. And, you know, I think it is true um, when some of us went to school, uh, every bit of school misconduct did not trigger a 911 call. And I, I, think it's, I think it's an important question to ask, is there something that schools can do? Are there ways that we can utilize um, the school environment where kids spend several hours a day as a community resource um, and see that as something that will also feed into 
what I think we all want, which is not just safer communities, but we want more humane ways. We want more uh, just ways to deal with kids, to respond to kids and to help kids. So I inherited a new district or a bigger district in Cumberland County. And I would doing a listening tour, talking to all the superintendents in the three new school districts, and they cannot afford to do one more mandate, one more thing. Um, they, the state gives plenty, the federal government does, you know, gives out a lot of mandates, they are tired. And then we have a teacher shortage problem that, you know, um, their teachers are getting poached from other places, getting, you know, bonus pay. I mean, they are having a hard time. I, I don't, especially at this time, want to ask them to do something else. And then um, I think there was an idea of a detention center at school, which the facilities there, but, you know, school has to be a safe environment instead of having a trigger effect that this child has to stay and get punished is, I don't think, the way to go. Um, and more counselors at school, absolutely. More social workers, absolutely. Group, you know, exercise, meditation classes, whatever. I think that's something we can do within the realm and what we have right now in terms of uh, faculty members. Thank you both. Is there a, a question before I move on to my next question? And if anyone in the audience, uh, the live audience has a question, uh, don't be afraid to raise your hand. First question is, says, thank you for your comments on diversion. Please tell me what it looks like or what it should look like if there was funding. Ms. Levick, uh, can you tell us what you what your ideal uh, idea of diversion would look like? Um, yeah, I mean, I want to, um, you know, give a nod to Representative Kim. I think that the wraparound type services that she described, which are out there, they exist in some communities um, and they exist in other states, is a form of diversion that is available. Um, again, I don't think when we talk about diversion, we are trying to envision a world in which we can inter connect with kids um, who may be on the verge uh, or you know, about to enter the juvenile justice system, but for whom we can identify community-based resources that can uh, work with them before situations get out of hand. Wraparound service is one way. There um, are other programs in Pennsylvania. There are uh, evening reporting centers or after school reporting centers so that kids have places to go when they may not be able to go home um, because of whatever their family setting may be or what their family needs may be. Um, there are a lot of models out there that have been used effectively. Again, the point of any diversion service is, is not to look away um, and not to just send a kid home. The point of diversion is about identifying needs that the child has. It could also be needs as Representative Kim acknowledged. Rep it could be needs that the family has as well and responding to those needs in a way that is designed um, to keep that kid from coming back into the juvenile justice system. Any comments on that, Representative Kim? Okay. I I'll move to, then I'll ask the next question to you to get started. Um, expungement. Um, and I know you've, you've worked with uh, some folks who've had prior uh, criminal issues and, and histories, and some of those people have turned out to be some of the, the best representatives of the community. Um, why is it important that uh, expungement be at its earliest possible stage for juveniles? Why do you think that's important? If you think it's important. I think it's important. Uh, having a 15 year old and an 18 year old myself, these kids are, they don't think well. <laughs> and they're constantly maturing and their brain is maturing. The, the, the kids that you will see as a 15, 17 year old will not be the same in their 20s and 30s. So I don't think we should handicap them, put the the, handi the handcuff, so to speak, on for um, not the rest of their lives, but for, you know, decades um, in the future. That's not fair for them. Um, I think if we can uh, rehabilitate them, do the diversion programs and get them better, um, they should not have to suffer with a charge on their record for a long time. And Senate Bill 170 has um, reforms to the expungement process for the juvenile um, by Senator Baker. 
Yes, and I and and I in taking a look at that, um, do you feel that there should be that standardized process for automatic expungement? expungement. I'm for that. Okay, great, great. Attorney Levick. Yeah, I mean it's about second chances, um, which is really what Representative Kim is also saying. Kids uh, make mistakes, and some of them make very serious mistakes, but they will not be the same person in their 20s and 30s that they are in their teens. And uh, records can be extraordinary obstacles to children being able to make that transition from childhood, teenage years, adolescence to adulthood. And it is in our interest, I think, to remove those obstacles so that they can uh, have access to education, access to housing, access to employment. Um, I agree the Criminal Records Act that Pennsylvania passed, I think was a great step in the right direction in terms of eliminating employment barriers. Um, but for kids, it starts early. Um, if you saddle them with a criminal, criminal record, um, even if it's expungible sometime in the future, the lack of automatic expungement um, is, is a problem because it means that kids have to know how to access the system. Uh, they have to know how to come back into that system to get those records expunged. So I think automatic expungement, early expungement, uh, is really one of the critical tools that we need to put forward in Pennsylvania. Yes. Good. Why don't I bring the microphone to you? You can hear what you have to say. Hello. Okay. <laughs> um, I actually uh, kind of raised this issue uh, earlier today in this room. We had um, police uh, state troopers here uh, earlier with the, um, I think it was the criminal law uh, group. Uh, my issue is I worked in pro bono juvenile defense in uh, New York. And I think the biggest issue is some additional procedural safeguards. When the juvenile is arrested, they're brought to the precinct. They're put in a room and there's a recording going on. You know, God willing, they read their rights. But what, what I notice is that it there seems to be a loophole. And when the parent arrives, the parent, of course, is concerned. Their child has just been arrested. And then they begin to take on the role of being an investigator. They say, who are you with? Did you know this car was stolen? Is that your gun? Whose drugs is it? Give them a name. And that is all admissible in court, you know, but the parent doesn't know that their parent first lawyer second. Um, so I just want to ask, do you think there should be additional procedural safeguards, perhaps warning the parent when you step into this room, anything you say or that your kid says can be used against them? So I, I can address that. Um, I think it's a really great question. And thank you for that question. Um, yeah, there's actually quite a bit of research that demonstrates that parents are often not the best advocate for their kids when they are arrested. I think understandably, um, you know, parents, we teach our kids to, that honesty and truth is a value. And we want our kids to tell the truth. And that's often what happens inside the interrogation room. There are a couple of jurisdictions around the country. I'm thinking about California and Illinois um, that have recently enacted legislation to require the presence of counsel in not all, but most um, interrogation settings. This is a financial issue. We've talked a lot about finances, obviously, when we think about legislation. Um, who's gonna pay for the public defender to show up um, at the police station when kids are first brought in and interrogated? Um, but if we can look beyond that for a minute in terms of due process and fairness and protecting kids' rights, uh, it is actually absolutely critical that we figure out a way to ensure that kids have access to counsel during interrogation. Uh, kids are very prone to make false confessions. They are overrepresented among the cohort of individuals, young and adult, who make false confessions. And certainly having counsel present is one way of avoiding that. We're, we're running short on time, so I have two areas that I, I want to cover, and then I'll let you, if you have some questions, we'll finish with those questions. First of all, uh, the, the age uh, at which a child can become delinquent. Uh, right now, we're at 10 years old. Should we be at 13, 14? Is, is, there, a, is there an age, is 10 too young? Uh, 
you know, what do you think that should be? Um, and I'll, I'll turn to you, Attorney Levick. So um, it's not just that it's 10 in Pennsylvania, which I would argue is ridiculously too young. If a child is charged with homicide, they can be five, six, seven, eight, nine years old. And in fact, we had a nine-year-old charged with homicide a few decades ago in Pennsylvania. Um, I can share a couple of things. The international community has essentially now um, really identified 14 as the ideal age at which to establish um, entry into their juvenile justice systems. Uh, the US often isn't interested in what folks are doing around the world. Um, but I think that that is a, a useful guide for us to think about what our own jurisdictional age limits should be. There have been also uh, some legislative uh, action in other parts of the country that have raised the age to 12, raised the age to 13. I believe, and Representative Kim, you can, um, you can check me on this. I think there has been legislation introduced as part of the package of reforms coming out of the task force um, to, I think, set the age at 12 or 13. Is that correct? You're correct. And I believe it was 12 because it was like a compromise yeah. within the, the task force. So um, if I plan on co-sponsoring and I plan on voting um, on it to raise the rage to, to 12 or 13. And I think that that's going to be a, a great uh, a bill if it does pass. Finally, uh, so kids get saddled with, uh, and this is my final question, we're, we're getting short on time. Kids get saddled with fines and costs um, as a result of their cases in court. Uh, and as we indicated, we could have as kids as young as 10 years old um, getting these fines and costs on top of the restitution. Let's just talk about fines and costs right now. Should we be eliminating the use of fines and costs for juveniles? Uh, and I'll turn to Representative Kim first so that Ms. Levick, you can have that last word on that. Yeah, as I was reading the report, you know, um, kids failing to pay a fine, you know, and getting readmitted is really sad. And just thinking of the impoverished community, um, there is a bill, you know, you guys are sick of me hearing this. There's an app for it. There's a bill. Okay. These are good bills uh, that would cap the fines at $10, which I think is fair capping at $10. That's something I would be supportive um, in this session. session. Great. Thank you very much. Attorney Levick. Yeah. Um, I, first of all, I think it's great. I know that there has been legislation that's been introduced. Juvenile Law Center, as an organization, has been doing quite a bit of work in this space. Um, you know, our our first line is, of course, to eliminate all fees and fines uh, for the reason that this is often not something that is born by kids. It's born by their parents. It's born by their families. Kids don't have any independent financial means, and when they are stuck and unable to pay it's inevitable that the parent bears the burden. Um, and that's completely unfair and inappropriate. And it adds to the financial woes that many of these families are already experiencing. All right, and I'll see if there's any final questions. There's two. To what extent do the panelists regard the Pennsylvania citizenry to be aware that both the juvenile and adult justice systems can be described in the words, not justice, just us? Well, if the if the purpose of the question is that justice should be about just us, um, nothing about us without us, which is a phrase we all hear being said repeatedly, um, I agree with that. I think that, as Representative Kim said, I have met so many individuals um, who have come back home to their communities who were formerly incarcerated children serving life without parole sentences for homicides that they committed before the age of 18, um, who are some of the most amazing, um, remarkable contributing members of their communities. And they have a lot to teach us about what these systems should look like. And I liked how Marcia said in her um, TED talk about how the kids who were stuck in that system, you know, they called it just ICE, I-C-E and that it was a cold, you know, harsh punishment and that we need to get away from that to make it more justice. 
And why don't we do this? We have one more, we have one question in the room. So let's, uh, since we're running short on time, let's address that question. Uh, and then we can probably call it a wrap. All right. Yes. Uh, Uh, Ms. Levick, were you able to hear that question? No, I can't hear anything at all. <laughs> okay. I, I think the question was uh, about private schools not having to report certain things. Uh, and so it leads to a disparity from a public school to a private school in terms of incidents that happen at the school and those being reported. Is that about right? Um, That's something new to me. I did not know that. Yeah. I think this should be a requirement for all schools, charter, private, public schools to have the same? I mean, there are some exceptions, um, ways in which private schools, because they are private schools, um, are not bound by all of the same requirements that public schools and uh, are bound by, and even charter schools have some exemptions um, from some of those requirements. So I don't know, I don't know what to say about that. Um, the law has been set up that way. Uh, it's not unique to Pennsylvania. It's true across the country. I think when you have private school settings versus public school settings, there are things that will probably end up looking like it's unfair. Um, but that's kind of the way the system has been set up to operate. All right. we'll, we'll, we'll give you a, a chance after, <laughs> but I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Uh, so first of all, I, I am humbled uh, that these two phenomenal speakers would uh, take my invitation and come and speak today. And I think you can uh, agree with me uh, that they gave us a wealth of knowledge today on a topic that I think is, is moving. Uh, and uh, we all are interested in seeing some reform in juvenile justice, how it's gonna look and how it's gonna impact uh, the young people in our community. So uh, thank you, thank you very much. Please give them a, a round of applause. Thank you all. Thank you all. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you doing this. You know that. Okay.